It sometimes feels as if wild animals are getting out of control. They're in our cars, our yards, our homes. They're in our face. It seems that if we build it, they will come. I'm looking to damage approximately eighteen to twenty thousand dollars. I tried to tell myself that they don't mean any harm, but it has not worked. There was approximately 32 boat slips that were commandeered by these animals. When snakes move into a basement, they don't really take into account the fact that they're invading human space. But animals have less and less space as people push back the edge of wilderness. In fact, a tug of war plays out everywhere people live. The sad fact is that few creatures can put up a fight. Most have no choice but to turn tail as the human tide advances. Conflict comes from the few canny species that have the right stuff to challenge or even exploit us. Who are these survivors? What hand do we have in their actions? Can we learn any lessons from animals behaving badly? This southern elephant seal, like most animals, wants a place to call his own. But Homer has mistaken a dock in Gisborne, New Zealand, for the more usual haunt of an isolated rocky shore. Homer now sees people as competitors for his new turf. Some New Zealanders see Homer as the trespasser. It's the kind of standoff that becomes inevitable as people take over more land. When you realize that Homer needs territory to attract females, his behavior becomes less puzzling. And to hold the territory, he has to fight chest to chest with other males, or in this case, with trucks and cars. To Homer, vehicles look like rivals and he isn't keen to share his harem with a Ford. During his tenure on the wharf, Homer trashed three cars and plenty of garbage bins. More importantly, he trashed our ideas of just who's in charge when animals and people collide. Our impulses toward animals are contradictory. We want to control them, but we also want to see them wild and up close. We've had people standing their children within a metre of them and getting the uh, prize photo. Absolutely ridiculous. This animal's around 2,000 kg in weight and a small child's around 10 kg, it's not gonna be much of a contest. In the end, Homer's charm won the day. People eventually backed off to let him rule the wharf. But after six weeks without the arrival of a single female, Homer gave up, beating a somewhat inglorious retreat into the sea. Humans want the same things as other animals. Territory and shelter. Water and food. 
As we and our fellow creatures pursue the basics of life, we come into contact. Most animals flee, either in fear or because the new environments we're creating can't support them. But sometimes, a human environment can become a surprising oasis for other creatures. An extraordinary animal encounter began in a Southern California swimming pool, which happened to be smack in the middle of the migration route of mallard ducks. The story began when I had a duck decoy in the pool. And this is a decoy, and it contained chlorine, um, which you have to have for your pool water. And one mallard couple flew in the pool. I think they were attracted to this, and I saw them floating out there one day. They were very friendly, and we just welcomed them, and um, they felt safe, and they stayed. And pretty soon I noticed, after about a month, the female was flying into the bushes. So when they left, I looked in the bushes, and she had a nest. I love animals. And then when they had the babies, it was incredible. Of the original 10 ducklings, we ended up with nine, because a predator did get one of them. Because of that, I began sleeping outside at night. The weather was nice, so I kind of guarded them to make sure that we didn't lose any other ones to predators. The duck family eventually left, and life returned to normal for the Simons family. And then about three weeks passed, and they started to return, which was really kind of exciting, because I thought, oh, you know, great, they're coming back. Simons then started feeding her ducks, but she had no way to guess the size of the incoming squadron. Each morning, the hundreds of ducks came in was totally new for me. It's just kind of a miracle. To support her flock, Simons was soon shoveling out 230 pounds of grain a day. Eventually, she sensed that she had too much of a good thing. It was time for tough love. Because we really wanted to preserve the wilderness, uh, I did stop feeding. It took a month of gradually stopping, putting out less food each morning. But it only took three full days for them to totally stop coming in. I try not to interfere with Mother Nature. I would not recommend it. What I did, it just happened and it snowballed. The very good part about it is I don't believe any of the ducks were harmed. Simons had discovered just how powerful a beacon food can be for an animal. Here the invasion ended with no harm, no foul. But typically, feeding wild animals starts a conflict that isn't easily resolved. One creature is particularly adept at getting handouts. Like most animals that thrive in the human wake, raccoons have a set of traits that make for flexible living. They den almost anywhere. They breed fast. They're smart, and they have eclectic tastes in food. Raccoons are, in a word, generalists. And generalists are often the beasts that bother us. Resourceful creatures, they'll find their way to the head of any breadline. The problem begins when we erase animals' natural wariness of us. Emboldened beasts spend more time around us trying to crack our systems. But animals taught to seek food on human turf are courting dangers they can't understand. These same animals are also the ones likely to plague people, even those who have never fed them directly. In San Francisco, Christian Werner wanted his cat to have the freedom to come and go. But when night comes, the Werner's open door policy attracts other beasts. Werner captured an uninvited guest on home video. This raccoon was first drawn to trash cans outside the house. A curious animal, it then discovered even better offerings in the garage. From here, it was only a short hop to the kitchen. Ever since the kitty door was installed, 
Werner has had to investigate things that go bump in the night. They're very messy animals when they get into the house. They will actually go through the, the containers of cat food in the pantry. Werner set out to make his house raccoon proof. He built a sliding door to close off the cat entrance after hours. Raccoons were discouraged. Other creatures were not. We were hosting a charity black tie dinner in the house and we had a chef in the kitchen working and I was at the head of the table and in prances three skunks and they were heading for the kitchen for the cat bowl. They'd obviously been in before. I got up and intercepted the skunks that immediately turned around and went out back through the garage. When the dinner was over and, we were, and our guests were leaving, Two of them commented that they thought they smelled skunk in the yard, in the driveway, and thought that there must be skunks in the neighborhood, which we couldn't understand. Werner finally added a strip of wood to keep invaders from squeezing under. The new system works in principle, but it's hard to remember to close the cat door every night. And hungry critters are just waiting for a lapse in security. We are so drawn to some wild animals that we feed them, just for the pleasure of seeing them in our gardens. But anyone who's stocked a bird feeder knows that most of the seed doesn't go to blue jays. It goes to that featherless bad boy of the backyard, that master generalist, the squirrel. We set up an experiment to test a young rodent's problem-solving skills. We started with a clothesline, an elevated highway. How inventive will he be to reach the seed? Next, we move the clothesline away. Now the only way up is a slippery post, an easy job for a tree climber. If squirrels are anything like their cousins, rats, they have detailed mental maps of where to find food. And when faced with a detour, they can figure out an alternate route. We now add an obstacle to his path. A bit more wary, our squirrel is considering possible dangers. But one reason for squirrel's success, and behavior we consider bad, is that they're always ready to explore the new. It may be a stretch, but our squirrel again wins the seed. Next, we make the post impossible to climb. But to test learning skills, we've also added a new but fiendishly difficult route to the prize. An elevator leads to a steep ramp, but first the squirrel must climb a rope. Perhaps the Marines should be looking for a few good squirrels. After much trial and error, this intrepid squirrel seems to be solving our puzzle. Born in trees, squirrels excel at judging the chance of success of an acrobatic maneuver. All that remains is a dizzying leap to the food. Food, fear. Food, fear. In our backyards, victory goes to the bold. Another generalist, a black bear, was captured in this Colorado home video making off with a discarded oven. 
Attracted by the scent of grease, she's moving at a safe distance from people before exploring her treasure. Bears become less shy when they meet people every day. In Yosemite National Park, after many human encounters without bad consequences, a bear figures out it's a winning game to approach our food. Once they learn that people aren't going to hurt them and they will, in fact, willingly give up food to them, uh, bears learn pretty quickly that campsites are a great place to go get a bite to eat. Bears are well equipped to find food wherever they live, equipped and motivated. They're driven by an incredible hunger. Um, a lot of people refer to bears as being walking stomachs. It's driven by a really powerful sense of smell, something like 100 times better than ours. There's a period of time in July and August when vegetation is, is drying out, berries have not yet ripened. That's tourist season, and the tourist crop of food is an easy one for them. By leaving food inside cars, people have in effect trained bears to become aggressive smash and grab artists. In one year alone, Yosemite bears caused over $600,000 in property damage. It's really amazing to see bears go from car to car and look in each car and put a nose print on each window and how easily they really have figured out our system here. The whole thing takes less than 30 seconds. That Once the bear picks the car that it's gonna break into, it, it's actually quite easy for them to break glass or peel a car door down. Really, it's just like tearing open a log looking for ants. It's obviously a behavior that we don't want bears to do, but at the same time, you really have to hand it to them. Bears are not only very intelligent, but they're very curious. And that, coupled with an ability to learn, um, really puts them over the top when it comes to figuring out our system, figuring out people. Because the Yosemite bears are so smart and brazen, rangers have had to start a tough new program, training them to once again fear people. In this parking lot, if, if we were to come in here and encounter a bear in the parking lot, we'll try and, at, at the very least, get a pyrotechnic off, um, a really loud firecracker or uh, a big pyrotechnic display of a green weenie. Um, if, if at all possible, we'll try and hit it with pepper spray and give it a clear out and get the message to the bear that it can be up in the oak woodland, but it can't be in the parking lot checking out cars. These lessons are saving bears' lives, since rangers might otherwise be forced to kill aggressive animals. Bear incidents in Yosemite are now declining as we figure out how to share the park. It took us a long time to get to the point where we realized that it's easier to train one black bear to, to live around thousands of people than it is to train thousands of people to live around black bears. Most bears, because they're so adaptable, have, have really accepted the new rules and, and learned how to coexist with us beautifully. I'm, I'm really proud of them. Bears are smart, powerful, and persistent. They will always look for another way to outwit us in their pursuit of what motivates us all an easy meal. Perhaps it's not surprising to encounter animals in national parks. But in other parts of the world, forest creatures are becoming a part of everyday life. Monkeys don't seek human contact. But when people move in for a closer look, these savvy generalists start to act differently. Monkeys become less shy when we gawk at them. We also cut back their habitat. So fearless monkeys move into cities where they find opportunities for mischief. They take up a life of petty crime. A monkey might begin with a small offense, shoplifting fruit or bag snatching. The motto of these thieves seems to be, fill the other cheek. We then nudge monkeys from misdemeanors up to felonies by offering snacks. They link us with food. 
Monkeys are helped in their criminal careers by adapting a natural behavior. They use fierce expressions to threaten and bluff each other. These same gestures are enough to make any sane person back down. When humans and other creatures share territory, we often escalate the conflict. Behind many an animal behaving badly is an unwitting human trainer. While food is a natural realm of conflict between animals and people, the battle for territory can be just as sharp. The magpies of Brisbane, Australia evidently feel crowded during nesting season. For six weeks a year, to protect their chicks, magpies are highly attuned to any approaching creature. Magpie's instinct to drive away hawks and eagles extends to human beings. Another creature claims our territory in a more stealthy fashion. In Switzerland and neighboring countries, some kind of beast was sabotaging cars. Over 100,000 of them every year, under cover of night. The mystery was finally solved during an all-night stakeout by a dedicated Swiss peace officer. The culprit was a slinky weasel relative called a stone marten. Martins have discovered that an engine compartment is a warm place to hide, stash food, or just take a break while patrolling their territory. But if one Martin detects the scent of another, someone's been sleeping on my engine, it will go berserk. This is road rage weasel style. One animal is fighting the smell of another over turf we think is ours. Creatures will stop at nothing to find good shelter. In Manitoba, Canada, the residents of Alonza must reckon with an animal that insists on sharing their buildings, especially the school. Thanks. So what else can we do as a send trained workers to do? I try to tell myself that they don't mean any harm, but it has not worked. I know that they're here somewhere today, and that, that really bothers me. When the invaders come, they come in droves. I can't stand the sight of them at all. Garter snakes have appeared in every corner of the school. afternoon I was heading towards the PA system because a bus driver was calling me on the, the radio and as I picked it up and was putting it towards my mouth there was a snake that was nicely curled right underneath. I dropped everything and just went into the staff room and I didn't even have to tell anyone why I was there. They knew. When I come across a snake Especially if I come across one unexpectedly, you know, it's like it's suddenly it's there. I just get completely terrified. The snakes invade as they emerge from hibernation.
garter snakes spend the winter underground in a natural pit at least eight feet deep, below the level that freezes solid. In spring, the snakes boil from the ground to mate in giant squirming knots. This is when Alonza's conservation director, Harry Harris, starts to get calls from the school. The school's problem actually started at the farm next door, where snakes used to spend the winter in the basement. And when the farm changed ownership, the, the new owner filled in the basement, and when the snakes came back in the winter time to hibernate, the, there was no place for them to go. So naturally enough, what they did is they moved over to the next building and that happened to be the Alonzo School. I think probably some of the kids might think of me as the snake guy, because when they see me coming in and going into that basement, they know exactly why I'm there. The snakes are only doing what comes natural to them, and that is going down underground. They don't really take into account the fact that they're invading human space. For a snake, all that matters is not freezing to death in the long Manitoba winter. Harris takes the snakes he collects to a rock pile behind the school, where students have created an artificial pit. As good as these new digs may be, come next winter, many snakes will slither back to the warm school basement. Other creatures aren't coming after our buildings or territory. They're coming after us. Yellow jackets, for most of the summer, eat fruit or caterpillars. But as autumn approaches, their natural food runs out and that's when they begin to pester us. Yellow Jackets are an aggressive air force. How do they know the exact location of our picnics? We set up an experiment to see why these wasps are so good at grabbing our grub. We offered them tuna presented in the center of a circle of gnomes. One Yellow Jacket finds the food simply by chance. As she flies off, she turns around to take a kind of mental snapshot of the terrain. Don't look back is bad advice for wasps. When she returns to her nest with food, her sisters know to fly off to seek the source. Wasps don't give each other directions. After random searching, the new wasps arrive and take their own snapshots. But exactly what will they remember about this location? To find out, we removed the food. But wasps kept coming, so they weren't attracted by the sight or smell of tuna. Next, we moved the gnomes, but not the empty serving stand. Tellingly, wasps ignored the stand and visited the gnome circle, even though they'd never been fed at this location. Did they recognize the shapes and colors of the gnomes, or their arrangement? To find out, we changed the circle to a triangle. And then we offered the yellow jackets a brand new circle of flamingos. Wasps zeroed in on the circle, even though it was made of unfamiliar objects. So wasps find food by remembering a configuration of landmarks, in this case, a circle. More typically, they remember the location of your favorite picnic table. Ah! 
An even more resourceful problem solver can steal our food even when we hide it. These swaggering ravens of Yellowstone have learned that snowmobiles are snacks on skids. Woe to the snowmobiler who relies on Velcro rather than padlock to protect lunch. Another smart bird, the Kia of New Zealand, has a zeal for play that makes it something of a troublemaker. In the wild, these parrots tussle like puppies. Play and a relentless curiosity may help them find new sources of food. But more often, it helps them find new sources of fun. No one is sure why these birds run a chop shop. But New Zealanders have come to accept that their cars are fair game for the parrot with an attitude. In their own way, ants are just as aggressive as Kias and exist in far greater numbers. You're listening to the sweet sounds of morning jam. The weight of ants in the world matches that of people, and ants have always taken their share of our food. What makes ants so unstoppable? What food are they looking for? How do they find it? To find out, we set out a feast to test the talents and tastes of ants. Carpenter ants don't find food by sight, and their sense of smell only works over short distances. So the ants, all female foragers, explore at random. They fan out when they reach the tabletop. Everything on the table will be sampled. Some of the ants stumble into a bolder field of peas. But ants are finicky. The colony queen never tells her daughters to eat their vegetables. Peas don't offer what these ants are looking for. Protein and sugar. A lettuce and tomato sandwich is no more appealing. But sweets are on the table. Raspberry jello is a perfect meal. Solid food must be carted back to the nest and handed off to other ants for processing. But this mostly liquid lunch is easy to eat. Once an ant finds ambrosia, her most important job is to spread the word. She paints a chemical trail with her abdomen. Her sisters pick up the scent with their antennae. A well-fed ant on her way home offers a taste of things to come to hungry ants on the trail. A restaurant review doesn't get more direct than this, mouth-to-mouth -mouth regurgitation. As their collective knowledge grows, helter-skelter search gives way to precise trails. If ants have a food fantasy, it's plunging neck-deep in jello. This accordion belly is quickly filled. Inside are two stomachs, 
one for personal use, the other for sharing. 20 minutes after the first ant reached the table, the colony has analyzed the menu and is focusing only on sweet or high protein food. Ants are persistent. Once they find a source of food, a pantry or a table, almost nothing we can do will stop them. How do they keep coming at us even when we disrupt their paths? We removed a napkin which held the chemical blazes of the trail to a slice of pie. At first, the ants were baffled by the break in the path. But going back to random searching allows them to solve the problem. And soon they're back on the trail to that slice of pie in the sky. Peerless invaders, ants will always plague us. But other creatures wait for our invitation. For one lucky animal, we've rolled out the green carpet. The artificial environment of a golf course is nirvana for the Canada goose. The links offer luscious grass, plenty to drink, and best of all, long clear views that prevent predators from launching sneak attacks. So geese have settled in and now outnumber eagles and birdies. And every day, these territorial animals encounter another tenacious breed. Golfers, who also think they own the course. Golfers might have decided simply to let the geese graze through, except for one thing. A single fowl deposits up to three pounds a day. A flock of 500? Well, do the math. No one knows the Tao of Pooh better than J.C. Girard, superintendent of a Massachusetts golf course. They tend to defecate on the greens and on the tees. Becomes unsightly and very smelly. Putting can seem more like pinball, and precision mowing is out of the question. Our mowers have a tendency to have the rollers cake up with material that they leave on the greens, and it affects the height of cut which in turn affects people's play. So Gerard goes off to battle. He's made the greens safe for putting today. But by tomorrow, new work will be laid out for him. It's not easy to drive the geese away, though Gerard has certainly tried. He's used inflatable balls with eye patterns designed to frighten geese. but the birds seemed unflappable. Gerard has deployed fake swans on the theory that geese hate swans. The geese seem to stay away from them for a while, but then realize that they just aren't for real and they just come right back and start eating again. Gerard has even taken up arms. Uh, we've tried firecrackers and bottle rockets. Uh, being on the golf course, you can do it a little bit, but after a while, it starts to affect, you know, the golfers. Perhaps Gerard's boldest effort was a spirited naval campaign. We purchased a small remote control boat. Uh, when the geese are in the pond, we put the boat in the water and, and chase them around with the boat. But the geese stayed on an even keel. Gerard is losing patience. He's decided the best solution might be a specialist. And he knows just the person to call. In Shipman, Virginia, Barbara Ligon knows the secret of a foul-free golf course. Ligon trains border collies to chase geese. Bred to herd sheep, these dogs need a special education to cope with the country club. Lesson one, meet the golf cart. Good girl, you're doing well. Ligon's enterprise began in 1990 
when she got a call from someone who had the same problem as J.C. Girard. One day, a golf course superintendent asked about a dog I had for sale, told me that he was interested in using her to herd geese off of this golf course. I had my doubts, um, however, he did uh, emphasize that he needed a dog with uh, impeccable manners, a dog that would stop exactly when told to uh, just prior to getting uh, to a bird. You know, a dog, of course, if it's unsupervised, would probably be tempted to pick up a bird or shake a bird. To prepare a dog for the wild goose chase, Ligon puts it through basic training. She plays drill sergeant as her dog plays eager recruit. And the sheep have no choice but to fall in line. Wait, wait, wait a minute. These trained dogs, um, you can lie them down right before they get too close. You need to be able to stop them. Lie down, lie down, lie down. You need to be able to send them to the right or to the left. After a dog proves it can handle sheep, Ligon arranges a tougher test, waterfowl. She has a pond stocked with ducks, very anxious ducks. Some border collies hate water, but this one appears to have the fire in the belly it takes to be master of the water hazard, as well as the fairway. These border collies are notoriously obsessive compulsive. They must be doing something and usually in a repetitive type style. So if um, the dogs are encouraged to move the geese, then move the geese they will as long as there's a goose around. Right there. There, Fred. Fred. Wait, wait. Wait a minute. Wait. Oh, wait. Good boy, Fred. Back on the golf course, Gerard's problems are only piling up. So we arranged for Ligon to visit with one of her dogs. This collie is suited to the course every bit as much as the geese. He's bred to bound after flocks, just as geese are designed to watch for four-legged predators. With nothing short of joy, Ligon's dog points the way to a new kind of answer to animals behaving badly. It's just taken off. It's been a wonderfully environmentally friendly solution to a very messy problem. Some conflicts with animals don't seem to hold out any promise for a gentle solution. 90% of Claude de Rocher's four acres in Methuen, Massachusetts has been flooded. Look at all these trees, they're dead right now, they're drowned. Uh, it used to be beautiful, you know, we had nice foliage. Now I got a clump of maples that's gone, I got some oak trees that are gone, and all because of a king size rat, the beaver. <laughs> Long ago, the beaver was hunted nearly to extinction for its fur. But this is a rodent on the rebound. Just four years after Massachusetts outlawed lethal trapping, the beaver population tripled. A pair of beavers fells up to 400 trees a year to build their dams and island homes. Only one other animal alters the environment as profoundly as the beaver. We are that animal. And perhaps that makes the beaver an especially worthy adversary. At least it does for Claude de Rocher. 
As you can see, I have extensive damage on my driveway, which was caused by a, a rise in the water table. And I'm looking to damage approximately eighteen to twenty thousand dollars. This is the dam. This is where they block things up. It starts at that corner out there, and it goes in a horseshoe fashion to that corner. Every so often, the Division of uh, Fisheries and Wildlife come over here. They'll breach the dam, but that same night, the beavers come along and they block it, and I'm back to where I started from. They'll use everything available. They took some of my pressure-treated wood out there, big long planks, eight footers, and they brought them down there at the dam. DeRocher seems to have a kind of grudging admiration for his beavers. If you're going to be invaded, your invaders might as well have talent. We have a lodge out there that they built. They're, they're pretty good little craftsmen. They're very intricate. You know, they weave woods in and out together. I don't totally blame the beaver. Uh, it's not their fault. They're getting over overcrowded. There's a lot of homes going up in the area. There's some further up, so, you know, the beaver sees a little place, you know, that's open. He sees a little bit of water, and he puts the dam at the other end. They created a brand new ecosystem over here. I was told by the uh, Fish and Wildlife they will never drain this to what it was. It's going to stay the way it is, and much to my dismay, I don't like it. Uh, I'd like to see much more of this uh, back to what it was, but it never will be. His property is submerged, his basement flooded, his bird bath toppled. But DeRocher isn't overcome with gloom. That's because he's captivated by one facet of his new ecosystem. Oh, look at my ducks. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. That's daddy's duckies. Oh, wow, wow, look at that. Yeah, I always wish for a duck pond, but you know, sometimes we have to watch how we wish for it. Now I have a duck lake, and I'm inundated with ducks, probably over 100 of them. DeRocher has learned that in a world teeming with animals, no man is an island though the waters are definitely rising. DeRocher emerged as a kind of winner, but so did his beavers. Is it possible we can all just get along? Compromise was the last thing on the minds of the owners of these San Francisco docks when sea lions suddenly invaded. No one is sure why they moved in. The takeover surprised human residents. One boat owner was out of town when he learned about the coup at Pier 39. I was traveling in Europe working as a conductor in Italy. And one night, I'm up in the middle of the night and have the television on, and all of a sudden I hear San Francisco mentioned in the lead for the story. I look a little further out of bleary eyes, and I see my boat and my captain on my charter boat out of San Francisco, surrounded by sea lions at Pier 39. This whole story created um, worldwide attention just because of the fact that um, here a group of wild mammals have taken over uh, a marina in a very posh area of San Francisco. The staff at Pier 39 was bamboozled. We were completely taken by surprise and off guard. It wasn't something that we were expecting. It had started off with just a few California sea lions and the numbers had increased so dramatically and so quickly that uh, we, we weren't really sure how we were gonna deal with it. There was approximately 32 boat slips that were commandeered by these animals. And you're looking at probably a million and a half dollars of private property that had to be negotiated. At first, we would escort our boaters down to their boats by using um, garbage bins that were on wheels to go ahead of them and protect them. It was actually very stressful for most of the boaters. Plus, it, it was incredibly noisy. At night, some of these people were living aboard their boats, and they said it was like living inside a dog kennel. One guy told me that one night, for example, he got up in the middle of the night, forgot about the population of sea lions around him, and stepped on one. And I don't know who was more frightened, actually, because they both yelled at each other, and sea lion took off, and he ran back up onto his boat.
There were a lot of very bizarre suggestions addressing how should we get rid of our sea lion population. And some of them were, uh, let's electrocute them by putting electric wiring through the docks to how about putting broken glass and nails on the docks. The Cousteau Society at that time were doing some experiments with a mechanical great white shark. They were having a lot of success with it at the time. And they had called and asked me if that if we would like them to bring that over here and bring it and put it in the bay, and specifically in our marina, because obviously that's a natural predator of the California sea lion. But Pier 39 decided on an even bolder course. They chose to back off. So we actually ended up cutting all the services off to the dock, that's the electricity and the water, and we offered the boaters alternative slips within the marina. They turned out to be really quite an attraction. The people that came to the pier to see the sea lions had a chance to really get up close and personal with them, which you don't normally have a chance to do in the wild or in their uh, natural habitat. And it became a very good economic benefit for all the business at Pier 39. It was an obvious and very natural attraction, and it was drawing a lot of people who really wanted us to keep the population and basically leave them where they were. I mean, they were here by their choice. thing we ever did was just leave them alone and enjoy that and I think there's a lesson right there that they turned the tables on us and it was, it's been a positive experience and we were wise enough to just leave them alone and enjoy watching them here When we sense a conflict with wild animals, we're likely detecting a conflict taking place inside ourselves. We want to admire creatures close up and feel a connection, yet we also want to control them. We all pursue the same goals, food and water, territory and shelter, but unlike our ingenious, resilient, and scrappy neighbors, Human beings can choose to step back, to share. These talents will serve all of us, for with any luck, we'll be negotiating with our fellow creatures for a long time to come. To learn more about what you've seen on this nature program, visit PBS online at pbs.org or America Online keyword PBS. This is PBS.